I am a George Corton. I am a big honor here. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are gathered here this evening to commemorate the poet George Corton, and we expect to have a great night. At the beginning, at the outset, I will call upon Laura Samaraku to speak to you on the culture and the effect that it has on the locality. Laura. A Cahia Lake, Agus Green at Uishla. It does talk is just is mean them workers to go all lesh and gushta. Tush and Quira a hoard them by him shahan up. Nilain rather curtain all his knee small arm now by he law her egg oak oid auto in the entire shop. Agus on Anna Kurme and the Dina at all Erin Gushta and Shah. Tashe Siler Gwil An Gra Kot on Kultor, Agus Gamorbor on Kultor, Fuimar Avi George Curtin Eg Wintlesh. Now Kahime Advoil, Nakrev Moran Oli Shagamse, Fui George Curtin, Agus Dirme Erin Gushte, Reint Oli Shag Kurkum Fui. Agus Tasagam Gumeg Dina Ele Eg Laut Fui on Sha Anok, Agus Beg Anahim Gajogam. In a hail. On ten of the van, go with arms a loud free now on cultor iguchina, agus on tunker a ta egan cultor eran eran counter a tuil. Tasa gave galer gama go with clue agus coil eran counter shav o have on dukishte. Agus ta anskel aulik dar noi fui anakid a chuke ella er fud natira. Now we draw on that noy, nakrev on kultor on gailga on kjol narinki agus marchende gomor sa fashion. I couldn't say an aha soring the nish agus tugan say dokus doing gwil aharu tagaha er shin agus nia wan gwil sim eg fas eg mwinch na herden sa kultor ta she fear gwil dina tresh takt o hira ella agus kritika on shahanokt. Tusk on Severus of Winnen, Lenar Goltor. Tugan she shin on Sprid doing a Lanunta rag, Leshenobara be a shul, Egna Hagrish na shunta. Hagrish kusu Leshen gumen lu class goil, Conran a goil, a coltus kyoltori ern, Agus anaquid agriselet and taisha, Ata exeheru on cultur goilig, Lefada on law. When I was asked to come along tonight to this particular function, I must say I was very pleased to receive such an invitation because I've discovered at all of these events throughout the country where local poets, musicians, singers and bards are being commemorated that it possibly would not have been fashionable some years ago to organize events of this kind. More than likely, people would have been setting their sights at perhaps people who had become very illustrious in a very limited way, in a very elitist way. But the local composers were very often ignored until numerous scholars noticed that they had something particular to say, that they were giving a social commentary on their, on their lifestyles and of the various people who had, if you like, the authority in the areas. Very often you found with the bards that they were prepared, if you like, to dilute those who were over or no and they did this through satire and so on. 
But what's important today, I think, is that the local philosopher, the local musician, the local singer, the local dancer are now coming center stage. And I've had the opportunity myself, indeed in many parts of the world, to see where Irish traditional music in particular has come very much into its own, into its own right. I, I know that one particular survey which was done in Ireland some years ago, which had been commissioned by the Arts Council at that particular time and was published under the title of Audiences, Amateurs and Acquisitions. It transpired that Irish traditional music out of all the art forms at that particular time came out as the premier pursuit, not just of adults, but the under age groups as well. I don't think in fairness that anybody would have forecast that back say in the 30s or the 40s or indeed even in the 50s. And from the 50s onwards we, we had a very big exodus particularly out of Ireland through emigration. There wasn't a lot of emphasis at that time uh, being placed on culture. Indeed you had many people who were making the argument what good, for instance, was the Irish language to you if you had to emigrate? What good was Irish music when you were going out into a different environment? Well, I think that the visionaries, and I'm talking about the people at local level, who very often against all the odds continue to organize classes and organize concerts when they wouldn't have very large attendances, or organize Kelehe, or whatever the case may be, I think those visionaries have been proved correct because in actual fact today our culture has become an asset. Our language has become an asset. Our music has become an asset. And in fact it's possibly one of the most potent assets that we can put forward in the context of tourism. I think where young people particularly are concerned, I think a lot of people were taken by surprise that the younger generation would take to Irish music, which many people might consider to be an old-fashioned musical uh, form, something which belonged to another age. And yet our young people in many ways have taken to that music and not only have they shown an appreciation of it, but they have been able to become probably the foremost exponents of that music today. And I'm not talking of tens or hundreds, I'm talking of thousands of young exponents of our music. And when you see the integration which is taken in Europe at the present time, most young people get the opportunity of traveling to continental countries. And while they're abroad, they find that having a culture of their own and having an identity of their own is particularly important. When they go to France or go to Germany, they don't find that it's the English language that's been spoken. Each country it has their own language and promoting it, and they're glad to be able to fall back on an individual culture of their own. As well as that, I think most people see our language and our music and our singing and our dancing as much more than just something of a mercenary, a materialistic nature. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that they are the marks of our nationhood. They are the elements of our national identity. And I don't think we should forget that, that we all, each country has an identity of its own. And the elements which make up that cultural identity, we should keep strong and we should promote. We've all been listening to the happenings, for instance, in the north of Ireland over the last few days. But the interesting thing was that our culture was never a divisive element uh, in the political scene in Ireland. Uh, the opposite could be said to be the case, particularly where Irish music was concerned. It didn't belong to any one religious group. It didn't belong to any one uh, political affiliation. It belonged to all the people. And rather than being divisive, one could say that it has played a very cohesive influence in bringing people of different traditions together. And that's why I'm particularly pleased that this event here is being held, because I think that it gives us all the opportunity of knowing more, in this case about the particular subject, George Cork of Mihal or Thuma, 
it will give us all the opportunity of knowing more about that person and his outlook. But the very same thing is happening, say, with the Charles Kickham uh, weekend, who always believed in promoting things, as he would put it, for the honour of the little village. Last year I attended uh, that particular event in Monaldehoan and I was delighted again to see so many young people coming along, the pages of Nak Nagao being quoted and the philosophy which was Kikkim and which many people would have suggested and indeed which the book itself suggested that that type of Ireland was disappearing. Kikkim would be delighted today that find that that was not the case. And for that reason, I think that all of the organizations like Conrad Nguelga, the GA, Coltus Kjoltorian, and all the other bodies, and all the local groups and local organizations who have done so much to promote our culture deserve the gratitude of our country. And tonight, I would like to congratulate the committee here and hope that this will not be just a once-off event. I don't know whether it's intended to keep the same subject or the same theme, but I would like to think that this event here would continue. Augusta Suilagum, Golanishe Raig O Blian Goblin, Augusta Mlan Kinchide, Gurakishe O Nart Gunart, Mata on Fenu Lucht Artuil, called Talk to Kleshen Fenu Lucht Nashunta, Augustus O Cardi, then Taisha, a Kintoi, Guraki, Undakishin Raig. Of Liam Goblin. For a Mila Mahabib, I was Trace Liam Lib Galer Arish, for Mago. For a Mila Mahabib, I was just fair number all that. Good Lady Mira Raik and Liam Chikuing. Where the idea for this commemoration came from was when the Summer Festival was organised here for a few years back in Clondrahal. A book was launched showing the history of the locality. The name of the book was The Time That Was. And Dennis O'Connell wrote a fantastic article on the life of times of George Cockrell in that book. That was the seed in this locality of the interest in George Cockrell, in George Corton. It was further emphasized last December in the Aitch in Balavurna when a lot of his songs were sung and a lot of people from this locality went there to hear an excellent lecture when Sean O'Sullivan, Big Shay Kindly for Bowl. For this, tonight's proceedings, for us, the focal point must be George Corton. And for him, his centrepiece was this Carrigan Cross. And the whole world radiated out from there. And the songs of the singers that we have chosen tonight for you to listen to will come in a circle starting to the north of this Carrigan Cross and end up down near the Mons. And after that, then, we will concentrate completely on the Rokhan and the songs that George Corton wrote. So to get the ball rolling, I call in Peggy Lynch from the Bogra Hills. Oh, 
Bagra Hills, Thoralis, and John O'Man is going to sing Sweet Rock Al McCree. It was whispers for Clondrod Parish. One day as I chance for to strain, sure I met with a comely young damsel. I chance as I passed by the way, she was like the bright star of the morning. Most brilliant and charming was she. No other name shall I claim for my darling But that lovely sweet Grogal McCreen I approached her the moment I saw her Which I was known always to do and this was the question I thought of. I will quickly inform to you. Fair lady, if you leave your own father and fly from those borders with me, I would choose you forever, my partner. And style you, sweet Grogal McCream. Oh, she answered me in accent most wrathful, and thus reprimanded was I. Your questions are really unlawful. And the same the sir you cannot deny For fear you traduce me hereafter So give over your plover with me I would choose you forever my partner And style you sweet Grogal McCream 
until Kerry goes eastwards of Blarney, until Cork and Port Arlington meet, until the trout is not found in Blackwater, and dry runs the broad river lean. Until the sun rises west in the morning and shines o'er the lawns of Knockwheel, no other name shall I claim for my darling but that lovely sweet Grogal McCream. So sure as the summer comes warm. So sure as the harvest we reap, so sure as the blight catch the gardens, and the withered leaves fall from each tree, so sure as the winter comes after, and the spring wind we all sow the seed. I will choose you forever, my partner, and style you sweet Grog cream. Oh, I like well your sweet conversation, she said with a fair blushing cheek. I like well the answer you've made me, and I know that you seriously speak. I know that your heart it is warm and constant and always with me. So now I will choose you, my partner. And style you, sweet Grog Cream. And to carry an immense next morning, I took off my own darling bride. Nor was I afraid of her father for doing such an awful deed. I took her to sweet clown Alana, my wife and my partner to be. So now I will call you forever and style you sweet Grog Alma-Cream. <laughs> No lady left this village, and when she was living in this village, she was known as Nora Matty. She is now known as Nora Coakley, and she has learned a few things since she left here, so she's going to sing about the school in Banagree.
the boys, the benches, and the books I see in every tree. And visions sweet of playground pranks before my vision team. Joan Buckley shop, the thorns and tops, the old white thorn tree. Beneath to shade we planned and played a school of Ballinagree. I long in vain to be again upon that winding road. From Copling Bourne to Robin's Lock, my heart without a load. And That music made in song and shade, God bless you, Ballinagree. And often on life's weary road, when friendless and alone, up through the weary space of years, my thoughts have fondly flown. To I ne'er forgot the school of Ballinagree. Thanks very much, Nora. Well, if you win to Ahina, and we'd like to thank the people of Ahina for their support tonight, Ahina has given us Billy Sullivan, and Billy is going to sing the song The Blackberries, written by Dan. Ben the Master Corkley. Where would you believe? The hills are clad in purple and the sky lands were high. One cold September morn, when not loud or cast the sky. Down from Arma Valley comes a cool and gentle breeze. And won't you wander there with me to pick the blackberry? Oh, the young men all with joyous heart have gone on to the fair. And maidens gay and bright as they have gone to meet them there. But Mary dear, what need we care for neither those are dear. While hand in hand we'll roam along and we'll pick the blackberry. Oh, the gentle river on the flood at the foot of Ballinagree. And many's the briery glen it knows from Shran to the Lee. But Mary dear, what need we care for either those are dear. And we soothe our ears with music while we pick the blackberries. There is a healthy hillside where the hair lies long and free. And my more in lofty or looks down upon our we. Shady nooks by winding brooks and the hum of wandering bees will soothe our ears with music while we pick the blackberries. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Billy. Now I said at the start we were going around in a circle and finishing up below at the mans. Coming up from the mans now is John Rayardon. When we fixed, picked the song for him to sing from first, he was going to sing Shanna Golden. Outside the door, he had changed his mind, and while ago he was going to said he was going to sing Come Back Home to Erin. So I haven't a clue what he's going to sing, but I know he has a point in his hand. He's taking his stuff out of it, and he's making way up here, and he's after changing it again. <laughs> Oh, it's long and many a year ago since I left my native land. It's been no fault of mine. I left old Ireland when mother and I parted. Some bitter tears were shed. That night I dreamt of mother, and then my dream she said, "Oh, come back home to Erin. Come back to Erin shore. You know." Oh, you're always welcome, man. You're Irish to the core. Oh, come back home to Erin. Don't ever again to roam. Come back to the one that loves you. I'm a warning. Come back home. I know I have a sweetheart along with mother dear. She promised when I left her to be faithful and sincere. I hope she's kept her promise promise to me while I'm away though every letter that she writes like mother she would say oh come back home to Erin come back to Erin shore you know you're always welcome man you're Irish to the core oh come back home to Erin though never again to roam come back to the one that loves you oh my boy come back home oh now I must be going for the time I was away and when we we'll reach old island we'll have a chatty day tis there I'll marry Mary and with Maureen I will stay in Ireland dear old Ireland and everyone will say oh come back home to Erin come back to Erin shore you know you're always welcome and you're Irish to the core Oh, come back home to Erin, though never again to roam Come back to the one that loves you, oh my warning, come back home Come back to the one that loves you, oh my warning, come back home Good man, John. We'd have Connie in as well, only he's over in Canada. <laughs> One man who left Cardiff and went working in Dublin is going to speak to you next about George Curtin, Ty Healy. Dog Ty and Balisha, I guess we share over a fact how many are in the Gaelicta. Dog Shay Susan Sundrying, I guess we share more pre rule in the young. I guess Ta Anna Asaram will Ty Rash King Nook. I guess Ta Shay Kun Kudestarge. Shorsha or Kurig, August Hail, August Nahoran, a Hurt, David Doos, Saravig Sean, a kind live. James. Hardak to the Dolagumsa, Tushkar of Laura Shamurku, a kind of and Shin, I guess. Capum Sugar would be allowed us and kind to our publi as far as satir. I was nearly an hour of Sarum Pushin. I was Capum Sugar. Gorkor Gadigfi, I shin Gastelair, allowed us and far as far our lum, Fiovan, the mask, the politicori. Fasher, as far as nine and Well, the Green Ushla, I was a cordon. Tom, 
Han sås det bäst av oss. Hallo, hallo. Hallo. Att man sås det bäst av oss och så vidare. Istället för glor och en dess tacker näst i mat hukus. Er in de schappen ebre, en we zijn slefaan de glakmelis en gudde. Dan kloog is kaler George Carton, nu Michael Otoma, maar er ook een tempel naar hartjes. En we zijn niet naar gune, maar de komsje rijnt er aan, waar hij gudde, een gune, een mine en schaam. Die alles maak ik mij heb, er ook aan Carton, en we zijn kappen frischen, waar we hen ik er komen. No rakaila curtain, which we may have spoken of fair shark, no. In Muran Fahir, I'm less than a glass in the shell. Now, long before computers and the internet, and before access to the printed word became common, a large part of a people's shared knowledge and traditions were held and passed on orally. You could say, to use the language of the computer literate, that people surfed the waves of words which washed throughout the land, downloading information here, news there, and good old crack everywhere. In this society, the storyteller held a special place, and the mark of the good storyteller in one way is whether decades after his death, his words are still being passed on. Tonight we've come here to celebrate the words of a master storyteller, Michal Otuma, or George Curtin as he was known. Now the name George Curtin seems to have been a nickname rather than a nom de plume or a anim cleta. And a name which he didn't like, we are told. People in Balavurna were um, afraid, I think, to call him George Curtin to his name. I think it was very much a nickname, but you'll hear different versions of that story tonight. I often heard my late father speak of George Curtin, and I have a feeling that he knew him personally. My father often sang a uh, Curtin song, the Klagany Nu, which we will hear later from Sean O'Lehan, uh, a man who immigrated here from Balivurna to, to, make, to make his living, and I think more and more More, more importantly, perhaps, to provide a living for a, quite a number of people in this parish. And for that, I think we should thank him. <coughs> <coughs> My father often sang the pup that came home from Kledok, Auran, Akleshmi, Der Baul, Bedero, Nino, Sullivan. Now, that was a tradition in the old days. Uh, my father sat at the fireplace and at night, he sang these songs. He had no, he had no great audience, but uh, people could hear them on the, on the road. Uh, I think today, if we passed a house and if we heard someone doing that, I think the people of, of the white coats would be sent for straight away. <laughs> but th those were the times, and you know, I think we could do better if we, we, we could do worse than to return to those times. I have to cut my speech a bit short. I think I have a, I have a referee here from Karaganima who's a bit uh, strong on the clock. Uh, Mukrum or Mukrama was once a monster centre for bardic conventions. The earliest form of summer school, perhaps, and a suitably no noble precedent for our own humble gathering here in Clondra tonight. And it was perhaps inevitable that there should have been such a strong tradition of music and storytelling here in West Musbury. I understand that a term modern scholars use for the oral transmission of narratives is orature but I much prefer the Irish word Baelidis, which taken literally means education or instruction of the mouth. Despite Curtin's very short stay in the National School at Carraginima, or perhaps thanks to it, he had a great flair for composition, and just as importantly, a great sense for what topics would be remembered by his audience. Now, Antar Padre Olera, who lived nearby in Lishkaragon, and with whom George Curtin would regularly visit. He was firm in his conviction that Michal, as he would refer to him, was one of the finest wielders of words and rhyme he had ever come across. And Thayer Pather compared him to Robbie Burns, the great Scottish poet. A comparison not without some justification, as both men were of labouring stock, wrote in their local dialect 
and directed their work to and for the people. Not afraid to make the grand statement, and Thayer Pather even went so far as to assert that Curtin was superior to the great Burns, and that if his like was to be found anywhere else in Munster, the future of the Irish language would be secured. He said, and I quote, Shinnerarius than Don, at Matan Kuderadech or Malish and Machin, Ta Bootig and Villa Oakshin or Burns. Mata Puin, Da Hort, the Food the Moonish, Tom Grailing of Vale. At the 1901 Munster Fish in Tower Pader, when referring to Curtin's song on Gondal, which we will hear later from Norma Welsh, was to say, and I quote, even Thomas Moore's best lyrics are mawkish alongside this. No translation can give a remote idea of the original. Shinard Bolagodine on, on Tower Pader. Now Curtin wrote of the everyday things, but he exaggerated them, and he made them fill the grand stage of his imagination. He found wonder and entertainment in the smallest things, and soon the songs he composed for his own entertainment and that of his friends found a wider, a wider audience throughout Munster. He wrote of trespassing geese, headstrong and homesick hounds, his friends' immigration to America, and many other events. There is a sense of the absurd and the ridiculous in much of Curtin's work, which seems familiar to today's ears. His irreverence, his easy way with rhyme seems modern and reminiscent of somebody like Christy Moore today. Curtin's sense of the absurd finds echoes in much of Ireland's literature, from Miles Nagopoulin to Samuel Beckett. His siege of Port Order, Arthur, which uh, Michael Matty Kelleher, will, another, Im, in, another immigrant uh, from Clondra, uh, gone to Atai, he'll sing for us later, I believe. It is the lament of a farmer who regrets moving households, especially now that his old holding is occupied by a certain Mary O'Leary. This rambling, humorous tale of a farmer's regret is ascribed and exaggerated importance by a, a firmly tongue-in-cheek curtain who dismisses the siege of the Russian port order by the Japanese at this time as nothing compared to the troubles of the small farmer. And we always have the small farmers complaining. <laughs> Curtin had a way with words and an alertness of mind which in different circumstances might have earned him a reputation as a purveyor of witty sayings in the mould of Oscar, of Oscar Wilde. Ireland is quite unique in that the terms traditional and popular when applied to music and song are not mutually exclusive. This is evidenced by the survival of Curtin's compositions to the present day. When you look closely at Curtin's output, I think it deserves to win new admirers. Even when one does not take his lowly circumstances into account, the freshness and good humor of his, of his songs make them a remarkable achievement which could serve as a pleasant antidote in the, in the face of depressing facts of the late 20th century life. At times, what we all need is an injection of good news or fun, and that is what you will find on a closer examination of Curtin songs, and we will hear some of them, quite a number of them later this evening. From my own part, a visit home here to Clown Drod has the same effect. And even though I've been away for 31 years since I left, I think I've been at Mass here in Clown Drod every Christmas since then, except for one year, 1979, that was the year my son was born in December. <coughs> Finally, to go back to the future. I'm sure you'll agree, there was a time not so long ago when Minton the Tuhi used to look on visiting civil servants from Dublin with great suspicion, and not without good cause. One of the best evocations of this distrust or paranoia is to be found in unveiled book to Miles Nagopoulin's classic. So the news recently announced by my minister, Michael D. Higgins, and uh, Minister Higgins regrets his inability to be here tonight as, as a poet himself. He had an invitation, but he has no fewer than six uh, engagements in his own constituency of Galway this evening, so he sends his best wishes to the gathering here this evening, and I think he would, be, he would find himself very much at home here at Hunter. <clears throat> but my minister, as I say, recently announced uh, that Macroom is to receive funding of £150,000 for a new theatre under my department's cultural development incentive scheme. And this news was greeted by me with a mixture of satisfaction and relief. This funding does not merely serve to, to redress the picture of Dublin's bureaucracy, which I am sure many people here have, 
but it ensures that young men and women from the surrounding areas will have the opportunity, the encouragement and the facilities to engage in and keep alive the living tradition of song and music. The funding has been made available under the operational programme for tourism and consists largely of European monies. It is, I think, a recognition of Macrooms and the surrounding areas' long tradition of a vibrant music and performance tradition, and it will go towards the conversion of the first floor of the Palace Cinema into a 240 or 250-seat theatre and auditorium with associated facilities to include an area for performances, recitals and exhibitions for both professional and, in particular, amateur performers. Now, Curtin is a fascinating and shadowy figure with whom people around here, and many people, I think, increasingly since the publication of the, of the book referred to earlier on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the GEA, uh, they have grown up with. The facts of his life are sketchy, and you will hear differing stories as to why he's known as Curtin, the extent of his education, his family relationships, and so on. Curtin is buried in St. Governor's Cemetery in Balavurna in an unmarked plot. And I think that's a pity, I think, uh, to commemorate someone, I think we should uh, remember them. And I think many, so many people visit St. Governor's Cemetery. It's a, a mecca, I think, for people, not alone in West Musgrave, but in, throughout, uh, throughout Musgrave and further afield. It is not before time that we begin, we begin to remember this man who shaped our childhoods with his songs. I'm delighted to see so many people getting involved in this commemoration. A knowledge of local history and folklore is very important to us all. And many of us grew up learning a lot about the history and geography of foreign lands, and that knowledge was, of course, beneficial to us. But local history, geography, and folklore are infinitely more important in giving us an appreciation of and a draw for our own place. And before I conclude, I would just, on a, pers on a personal note, uh, I know one man would be here this evening, and that is the, the late Pete Hurley. Now, Pete was a, a very, <coughs> very able man, a local man, but I think a very intelligent man who perhaps didn't get the chance to display his intelligence or to develop it. I'm sorry, Pete didn't do that. Shin Shin Marata Gramil Magav Galera Sporbit Fine, Augusta Sulagam Gaglashiv Gavinoshiv Galera George Curtin, Ran Malakazur Isuluni in his DNA, nor a Kashmir Galera or on the Quid. I've been very impressed with the singers we've heard to date. So I see one of Kondra's great singers, Mary Toomey, here on the front seat. I, I thought when I saw her on the front seat we we hear a performance, but uh, maybe another day, or maybe later on in the night, we might hear uh, rendering from the Gramila Mother. Peter Lee's not with us. He was an original committee that set about organising this event. Pete died in the meantime, Lord Mercy, but his son Tim is at the door here and he's well able to take his place if anybody can take Pete's place. One thing I'd like to pick up a tag about civil servants from Dublin coming down the country and not being viewed with suspicion at the present time. I can assure Tig that if any civil servant with a calculator in one pocket and a tax assessment form the other, he'd be treated with suspicion if he comes around here. <laughs> Third thing I wish to say before I hand over to Sean O'Sullivan is that a booklet on Musgrave is for sale in the bar. It invigorates and goes to Pion and counter Sean. It's only 50 pence, and anybody who hasn't seen the booklet would be well advised to pick up one before the night is out. Anish, Tarda Hasaram, Kid Mirafalta, Akhir Rev, 
an tholaf shana sulvan kun kaint er shorsa kurta a hail a baha agus a ran agus na rakan. Ich hier drüber kann mir auch ein Olive gefallen. Mir ist es doch auch mit einem mit einem mit einem Olive, die mit Art gelohrt von der Kaffee und ein Mikrofon und Lob und nur es kommt. Ähm you're probably wondering why uh, somebody should be landing here from Dublin to speak to you about a local poet like um, George Curtin or Mihala Tuoma. Um my mother was a Kelleher from Drina Alling in Ballyvorney Parish, and she often used to say to me, "On Kelleher cat of Londra Hodamach." So either she wasn't uh, of the correct variety, or um, uh, <laughs> or she was, and I have as much right to talk about George Curtin as anybody else. <laughs> and I'll go for the latter hypothesis. I met some of the the, the true breeds since I landed, some more of them, that, 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 and uh, I've known a good few of them before. Okay, um, I'll just get straight down to business because I have a good bit to say about um, George. According to the state records, Michael Toomey, as he was um, registered, he was born on the 22nd of June, 1877. His father was Dennis Toomey and his mother, Ellen Toomey. Her maiden name was Herlihy, and she was a widow at the time the birth was registered. The name of the town land is given as Lacca. There's no town land called simply Lacca in this area. But Lacca and Stuicke in the civil parish of Novel, two miles from Knocknagree and five miles from Cullen, is generally called Lacca, and it seems likely that this was the birthplace of the poet. Now I say according to state records, because it wasn't unknown for the incorrect date to be entered at registration. By law, a child had to be registered within six weeks of birth, and this meant that if the parent were late, it was a choice between paying the fine or moving the date forward. According to George's death certificate, dated the 12th of September, uh, 1927, he was 54 years of age at the time of his death. And there's a difference of, for, for those of you as bad as myself at mathematics, there's a difference of four years. Um, so that means that either George's mother didn't bother to register him for four years and entered him as newly born, or a bit more likely, I would say, uh, that whoever filled out the, the death register accepted a good old guess at George's age, and he apparently aged quite considerably in the, in the, in the last years of his life as he wasn't in the best of, of health. So I, 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 I'm taking it at the state. Um, records are roughly accurate anyway. It is a bit unusual for them to be uh, four years old. So. I'm going to present a fair amount of material from the archive of the Department of Irish Folklore in Dublin, and I want to thank that department for permission to do so. In volume 737 of the manuscripts of the Department of Irish Folklore, Sean O'Croneen from the plantation in Ballymacira says of George Curtin or Mihala Thoma, um, he inherited the gift of poetry from his mother's people, Muintir Irlahan the Thinge, or the Thinge here Herlihis. Uh, in his book, Fili and Talain, Father um, Patrick Tuhig maintains that George's mother was a sister of Connie Desmond's father. Connie Desmond or Kruhura Dasuna was one of the Balavurna four masters who were mentioned in the introduction to Deneen's Irish Dictionary. He was a well-known poet in Shanachui, uh, a regular prize winner in Iraqtas competitions, and had many poems and stories published. Father Tuig was correct in that Connie and George were first cousins, but the relationship wasn't with Connie Desmond's father, who was known as Krahur Vaide, but with his mother, Connie's mother, Siobhan Herlihy, as, uh, and Ellen Hurley, he, George's mother, were two sisters. And that's how the, the, the relationship of first cousin existed. Further on in the same manuscript volume, Sean O'Croneen tells us that the poets Tayug Nathinye and Liam Nathinye were brothers of George's mother. 
According to the census of 1901, George's mother was 72 years of age uh, at that stage. And that means that she must have been born um, about the year 1829. This gives us some idea of the dates of Tyog and Liam Nathingy. And this is useful because it's difficult to get any solid information uh, on the Musgari poets from the first half of the last century. In the same volume, we find material that Sean O'Cronin took down from Mahuino Toma, or Matty Black, who was George's brother. Matty Black was 80 years of age uh, in January 1941 when Sean called to him. So he must have been born in 1860 or in January 1861. This would make him 17 years older than George. George must certainly have been the last in the family. His mother was 47 or 48 years of age when he was born, if the 1901 census can be relied on. Um, it wasn't all that rare either for people to suddenly age before the 1901 census because the people who were the older people at that stage wouldn't, there were no state records um, for the early part of the century. So if somebody wanted to claim the old age pension, the best chance they had of doing it was to say they were over 70 in 1901. Um, and George was the only son, the only person living with his mother at that year. Uh, I was actually talking to one man who was doing a bit of research in the uh, central registration office in Dublin and he said he had come across one gentleman who, who aged uh, 10 years between um, the time he was between 1901 and uh, no, between, between the time he was born and the 1901 census. He was actually 60, uh, he's actually 61 and he put down his age as 71 um, and probably got the old age pension on the strength of it. Um, George Curtin, at any case, lived with his mother in a house on the border between Drillia and Coralia. Now, according to the census, it was in Coralia, and I'd say that's probably accurate. If, it, if the whole house wasn't in Coralia, at least three quarters of it was. Um, a description of this area is given by Antahar Padrolere in his autobiography, Mishki al -Fain. I'm just going to give you a translation of it. Uh, I think my earliest recollection is being in the arms of some woman. I do not remember now who she was. She was standing inside the doorway so that I had a view out through the opening over the townland that is called Cahirin Dov and to the hill called Dirilie. That hill had and still has a long toothed gapped ridge and I well remember myself wondering at the teeth and the gaps between them and asking myself what caused them to be so rugged on the ridge of that hill. I remember after that how I grew to know the hill that is to the north of Dirilia called Coralia. I still remember seeing to the southeast from our door a house surrounded by great trees and being told that it belonged to Siobhan Buckley in Baan Etanachnik or Bar Etanachnik. I don't know which of them is right, and Thahir Father says. Siobhan had a son called Con Corkery. I became acquainted with him when we were both grown up. He was a decent, respectable man and a good neighbour. George went to school in Cardigan Imme although by all accounts he didn't spend too much time there. In his essay on George Curtin, to be found in the book, um, Time That Was, uh, edited by Dennis O'Connell, Pat Kelleher gives us a good account of George Curtin's life. He earned his living as a farm labourer, working mostly with Michael Herlihy from Drillia, until Michael Herlihy sold out and moved to Ballygiblin near Kenturk. He was friendly with Tate Sweeney, um, who was daughter Julia's, somewhere around there, they are right in front of me, in fact. Um, and with Jerry Creedon, who was a brother of Tade's wife, Mary Jane. Uh, Jerry was known as the miler because he was a great runner and was especially adept at running the mile. The very first international cross-country competition was held in 1898 between England and France. Another international cha championship, the second ever, was organised in 1903 between England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales and that was run in Glasgow. Jory Creedon was on the Irish team that took second place. Uh, to return to George, we're told that he was a great hand at closing drains and making wreaths. I'm going to leave the story of George's life now for the moment, um, because too much prose without a bit of verse gets me down, and I'd prefer to discuss his life through the medium of the songs. 
After writing a version of George's song on Gondal for the Irish Folklore Commission, as it was then called, um, now the Department of Irish Folklore, Sean O'Cronin makes this comment. This is one of the best songs that George composed because he composed very little in Irish, whatever the reason for it. In the first volume of Unmosgri, produced in June 1945, George's brother Dunnacha, who was professor in Carysfort, lists only two songs, two of George's Irish songs, on Gondal and the Claganna. The two Cronin brothers were the greatest experts of the tradition in this area, and it's difficult to discover any gap or lack in their information, especially when it came to the singing tradition. Their mother, Bess Cronin, was a singer of international reputation. However, at the time of writing, they were both only in their 20s at the time, they were unaware that a number of George's early Irish songs had been printed almost as soon as they were composed, between the years 1901 and 1903, in a magazine that had no great readership in this area, I'd say. It was called St. Patrick's and was based in Dublin. It was mostly written in English, but had an Irish language column. The first of George's songs to be published was on Gondal. A speech by Antahat Padre O'Leary in at Fesh in the Moon in Cork, the Monster Fesh, was reported in the Cundra na Gaelge Journal on Plea of Solish on the 14th of September 1901. This was apparently the first time that a speech in Irish was taken down shorthand, and the person who took it down was Richard Dofolu Fiachra Eilge. Um, I appreciate that most people here um, would be able to, would have enough Irish to follow and to have had their speech in the original Irish, but because I delivered an earlier version of the speech in Wailing, um, in order that no one who is interested be excluded, I'm going to present all the Irish language quotations, apart from the songs themselves, of course, that I wouldn't have the, not being a, a poet myself or not having George Curtin's talent, I wouldn't be able to translate the songs, and if I would, you can't really translate a song anymore, all you can do is do another song in English that is something like the original. So they're going to be unchanged. Um, so the... When these songs were originally published in St. Patrick's, they were published with uh, uh, an English translation, but the English translation was really only meant to explain the Irish to, to, um, to people who were trying to learn it. So I investigated the possibility of using the, the English translation published at the time, but it was such horrible English that it really... Um, it wasn't viable at all. I had to translate it into what seemed natural English to me, so that's what, what you're going to get for the explanations that go with the songs. Um, so that's what you're going to get, as I say, even though my English isn't nearly as elegant as Antahad Pather's Irish or the Irish of Dear Mid This is what Antahad Pather said anyway in his speech. However, the poets are beginning to speak again, Antahad Pather said. Only a few weeks ago I heard some of what they have to say. It happened that a gander crossed the boundary into a neighbour's land. A dog was set at the gander, the dog killed the poor gander. There was murder straight away among the neighbours. There's a young poet in the neighbourhood. His name is Toomey. I knew his father and his grandfather well. There was no one in Munster more fl as fluent in Irish as they were. This poet spoke. Um ran on the ne he said Shahul Sishkiel or Scafidi Glegal Glegal Gondel, Dimig Harkail the Nimul Mone is the whole grain deer in the Kaulish. That was all I heard of it, said in Tahad Pather, but if the rest of it is as good as that, this young poet is better than Burns. If there are many like him around Munster, the Irish language is safe. That was only the first half of the first verse. On Tahir Pader had previously written an article called on Gondal in the Cork Weekly Examiner on the 2nd of May 1895. Most likely it was another gander that was troubling on Tahir Pader on that occasion because George would only have been 18 years of age if, again, the state records are accurate. But that particular issue of, Cork, of the Cork Weekly Examiner and most of the early issues are not available anywhere. I think they might have been burnt um, when Cork was born by the Black and Tans around 19, was it 1920? Anyway, there, the, no, no library, I've checked all the libraries and they just don't have the first two years. So if anybody has to, happens to have cut out that uh, article by Antal Padre on the Gondel from 1895, um, let me know and I'll photocopy it. But I suppose the chances are fairly slack of recovering to this stage. Um, 
on the 9th of November 1901, and Gondel was published in its entirety in St. Patrick's. The Irish language editor gave this account of it. At the Munster Fesh in Cork a couple of months ago, and Tahat Padre O'Leary said that he had heard tell of a young man in some place in Musgrave, and that this young man had composed good and elegant poems in Irish to entertain himself and his friends. And Tahat Padre quoted one verse from one of these poems. That was all he knew of it at the time. He has just written to me and sent me the whole poem. He says, Here is an gondel for you. I have translated it and added notes. It is a fine piece of poetry. It is amusing and there is elegance and subtlety of speech in it that cannot be found in any English. Burns's poetry isn't nearly as good as this. I suppose Burns could have produced something to equal this if he had been working in Gaelic, but it couldn't be done in English. I have nothing more to say, says the editor, that was all in Tad Pather wrote, but in Tad Pather's own words, here is an gondel for you. And I think um, that uh, Norma Welsh would be uh, a great, great granddaughter of John or John O'Welsh, the man who um, set the, 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 the dog on the poor gander, is going to uh, <laughs> sing the, the gander for you now. And who better would be able to sing it? Because only for her great great grandfather, we wouldn't have the song at all. <laughs> so here is the gander, here is the gander for you. <laughs> I'm after um, considering the matter since he was actually her great grandfather, Connie Welch's grandfather. I think I added an extra generation in there the first time round, if I'm not saying. Unless I can't remember what I said myself. Um, great stuff, anyway. In uh, Mushki Al Fain, Antahar Pather describes the gander that used to frighten him as a child as Scafferig Legal Gondel in quotation marks. Uh, a conscious quote from this song and he described the terrain and when he was describing the terrain near his house he mentions the kyle which is explained by the Balavur and the four masters in Irish Lower and the Gaeling as a narrow level strip of wetland through or beside which a stream runs a complicated enough a lot of English for one simple Irish word but that's apparently what a kyle means anyway in case you were wondering. But when he was describing the quail, anyway, he says, the quail where another gander was um, killed years later. So there are two references to Ungaundal in Mishkiel Fein, and I'm sure many of the, the poor scholars around Munster studying Mishkiel Fein don't have an idea what the two references refer to at all. Uh, the Irish language column in, in St. Patrick's was called Antinachaska and its editor styled herself Farnamona. She was um, Norma Borthwick, an English woman who took an interest in Ireland and in Cundra and the Gaelingen. She came to live in Dublin 
and she and my dear near oil from McCroom set up the Irish Book Company or my internal our gailing in in order to publish and to have Pather's books without making um, editorial changes that other publishers insisted on, much to Antahar Pather's annoyance. Farnham Oma used to request sods of turf, meaning contributions in Irish, from his um, readers to put on the Tinnachaska or the, the Easter fire. A letter from Dear Midolaire of Liscarragain to Antahar Pather was published on the 1st of March 1902. Dear Midolaire was born in Liscarragain. He was a double second cousin of Antahar Pather's, or as he put it himself in his um, elegant Irish, Gael a tree is a tree a double second cousin. In Antahar Pather's grandfather Pather and his brother Diarmid married two sisters, Maida and Siobhan Tuhig. Maida was Antahar Pather's grandmother and Siobhan was Diarmid's. And Tahir Pather gives an account of this in Mishkiel Fane in page uh, 8 of the old edition for anyone that still has this. The chapter uh, Clomped Lee uh, in Mishkiel Fane, where Tahir Pather tells of an effort to evict his grandfather and other tenants by encouraging one tenant in a joint lease to accumulate arrears. Um, he, he gives us the story as he heard it from Diarmid's grandfather, who was also called Diarmid. Um, Diarmid had a brother, this is the young Diarmid, now Diarmid, the Diarmid who was writing these letters to, to um, uh, St. Patrick's, had a brother called Barney and the two of them were confirmed bachelors for a, uh, well, that's what they were anyway. <laughs> um, Diarmid, uh, for reasons best known to themselves, I <laughs> Diarmid learned Irish from reading Sheehan as it was published in Irish Lauren the Gaelling at the end of the last century. He applied for a job as Irish teacher under McCroom Regional Committee of Cunra the Gaelinge. At the end of 1902, or more likely early in 1903, he took up the job. About 1907, he took up uh, a similar job in Rathkeel, County Limerick, and he stayed there for years before returning to Liscarragh and to retire in the late 1930s. He was professor of the summer school at Clashed on the Moon in Ballingary for 22 years, he died on the 3rd of April 1942. He published three Irish books, Cogger Mugger in 1909, which was based on a, on a weekly article he did in the Munster News and Limerick and Clare Examiner, on Vringel Vaughan in 1934, a novel, and Seher Bliana in 1935, an account of the various tasks to be done on a farm in the course of the year. Ten Irish poems composed by Diarmid are listed by Donna Cochranine in Unmose Grief. Father Giroudo Nuala and Professor of Irish in Minuit College described Dear Madolera as a fine speaker of Irish, an able teacher and a Finnish rogue. <laughs> anyway, to get back to Dear Mad's letter on the first day of March 1902, here again is a translation of it. Our poet is busy, he said, praising our dear father. Dear Mad had written the letter to Antahar Pather and the whole lot was then published in, in St. Patrick's. Dear father, he said. Our poet is busy praising and criticising the people according as they deserve it from him, as Owen Rua say, said. Ever since you sent for Ungondal, and uh, this shows that it was actually Dear Midolaire who had sent on the words of Ungondal to Antahar Pather when he couldn't find them himself. The people around here are talking about nothing else. A poet from Kaituk went as far as to make another verse, and here it is. So here's the other verse. <clears throat> On take you can get a dull good in coil, a mad in the dear rig for him. A crown goes a sky, so slender hair, a sack in a hair of usle. We hear an alle, we lead a gushnakta, a quisker, a kaishmik no grone. A mother, gathered a honey gone, Latin. Indeed, of the Dalavons, that's going in. Uh, in the published version of that poem, he said, um, <laughs> that, <laughs> I, I don't know if a single verse deserve a round of applause at all. <laughs> anyway, um, Mother Agara, he said, the Hanigon, Mratin. But um, 
When Sean O'Cronin called around to Dear Medinine in Mill Street in 1941, he collected this verse from him, and Dear Medinine seemed to think it was part of the original song, but the, what he put down there was, Mother Gara the Hanigon Mranach. And Sean O'Cronin has a note on this, On Mranach, On Brunach the Veer Glaundav. Explained that that was um, the Welsh who was in Glaundav, and that, as we said already, was uh, John, who is referred to as. Jono and um, mentioned as having a fairly effective shotgun in another one of George's compositions. Um, anyway, um, to go, I'll just go back to this. Dear Dearmut says, We are not taught, told who the poet is, the poet that composed this extra verse, and so much the better, he says. Mihala Tuoma, which was, who was George, of course, found fault with these lines. We lead a geschnachte, a quizkirse kashmut nagronev. Um, the translation of the two lines given is the lily and the snow were at strife and contention in his cheeks. He said astutely, that's George, that lily and snow were of the same colour, that is white, and that one of them could not give reproach to the other, that there couldn't be strife or contention between them until the lily had gone rotten or the snow had melted, <laughs> and it would be a great shame to compare them with the scoffed glegal gown de or at that time, sorry. Um, he pretended to be furious with him, but to tell you the truth, he wouldn't prefer to have him idle. But since he'd found the weak spot, he decided to squeeze it, and he said, Mas Rodeganario Tilidav Lader is well of Gaganaka the Flesta is paid to the Valer to Kurme Festa on Rohire Anakrok Brego. And dear Mid carries on, if the man from Kartok has so little sense as to continue the strife, I'm afraid that Mihal will continue with the contention, Agus Gagoya Hushed Olin Angade. Um, the reference there between the, the, the lily and the snow was, um, as many of you might be aware, is that in the Ashling poetry, the normally describing the spare van, they say that her, in her cheeks, the, the rose and the snow were in contention, the, the redness and the whiteness, and nobody could tell which was going to win out. Um, you don't normally get an awful lot of red colour in a gander's cheeks, so whoever made the verse had no choice but to to, to, to put uh, the colour of the lily and the colour of snow in contention and Michal was quick to find the, the flaw in it and to point it out to him, or George. Anyway, um, Dermot continued on after this um, with, uh, with, with the next song that he was giving and that was, uh, I'll just, just continue on with the story. There's no stopping our poet yet, he said. Since he heard your advice, and all this letter as you remember was written to Antar Padr. Um, he has taken heart and has more mind than ever for poetry. A neighbour went to Kentort to get clogs. They can't be got any nearer than that. He brought them to three or four people. Shortly afterwards, we were scraping in a house one night. I told you that the original English translation was a bit hard to follow, and when I looked at whatever was there, it said something like um, night entertainment or something, so I had to look back at the Irish to figure out that it meant scraping. But um, that's why I decided to better rephrase it myself. So they were scraping in the house one night anyway, when two men wandered deep wind wearing the clogs. They made more noise, he says, than the creaking wheels. We started to laugh, but it wasn't long before some prankster said it was a great pity not to put them dancing. The two that were wearing the, crowd, the clogs weren't able to dance. The clogs had to be taken off of them by force and given to two dancers. The fiddler tuned up and started on a tune, and the two started to dance like mad. I said to the poet to have a verse made before the dance was over. It was no trouble to him. He had it made, and with the height of contempt for the clogs, he made a fine long song about them that will be around a lot longer than, the, than themselves. It would be hard to praise them any higher, bad and all as they were. I don't think the poet from Carter would have much hope of making this song. When Sean O'Cronin from the plantation called to Matty Black, George's brother, in 1941, he got the following short account of the of Niklagana. Nihal Othoma, he said, the informant's brother, made another song about clogs. He was scraping one night in Baratanachnik, and it happened that the man of the house, Sean O'Murhu, or Jack Murphy, had bought a pair of clogs. He put them on on the hearthstone and started to dance. 
some of the neighbours were in and they started to laugh. He must have been a strange sight dancing in the clogs. But George was looking at him and made a song about clogs. Dear Middle Lair is a count is much more detailed in this case, but Matty Black tells us that Jack Murphy was one of the original dancers that maybe weren't so good. Uh, and Dear Middle Lair probably didn't want to mention his name so close to the, the actual event. Now is um, Sean Alihan yeah, somewhere around there because my, my program tells me he's lined up to sing the clag and no better man. <laughs> Shan of Warknik Elikitin Tan Serin Kijing De Ginok Shek Lo Lek Lagunomo Hanigan Thros All Countish Agus O Banatik of them Wanchi Arnt Da Via the Number Glot dance, floor cum par do carmion let tans near Varogon club, mark nestuk feduna peir bracum aco soda ve artugus ova netica del walchin arnt ni quella na trayon a vienamon a piece of radel. A vi etrum ol, vi tanga brak leun de krekem no gaun mar gar u grogaun, che malam nak lumides o vanitika den wanchin alnt. Vi lais ne mile akidan ta. The scatter can wheel, leave we no truck. The pitter can find crown queer goose folk, and is more an allegrian. Nahar in deep goose orb and the tink of them watching armed. We fair ku sud er on fado is mak no ku slia kum de hjuli gla is mak hal de hag male bile da vro ik de kir kun skjön na slåt du fär agus o vänne tika den gulsin arnt agus o vänne tika we, we always have this problem myself and Sean. <laughs> um, now, long ago, you can. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised George Cotton doesn't rise out of the grave to come and listen to that. That's a mighty, a mighty version of that altogether. Um, after giving the song, Dear Middle Lady continues with a few incidents illustrating George's ability to compose a line of verse on the spur of the moment. Um, so he says, anyway, there's no show, but Michal, he said to straighten out a song that would be falling apart or to put in a, li a line when it wanted. On one occasion, he heard a man saying this line. Tom of Ansegil, he said, Good say, August Lack in the Cown. I'm afraid I can't translate that into poetry. It just, you know, it means that my wife is in Kilkre, lifeless with a, a stone to her head. It must have been a line of some poem or song he heard. But um, he said this about a dozen times without going any further. Tom of Ansegil, good say, August Lack in the Cown, he says. Um, in the end of the story, Michal said impatiently, 
Kusha ma thar noan biach leis ni bael na ga wana si aun. If she is, let her at it, and there's no fear but that she'll stop there, but, uh, but the original Irish rhymes and my, my translation doesn't, because um, I think no one could translate it into English, only George himself, <laughs> and he didn't bother. Um, another time he was giving me the words of a song, and I was writing them down for him, from him, I mean. He said a line like this, Seem Ashlingdom er labi klohir hasker vigimayanar. Somebody who was listening to him said, there's nobody under the sun, couldn't make a line to follow that. Without even looking over his shoulder, Michal said, Tan dunna sort kan gabbar uchtis de gynnat na heishtan. You're the devil for gabbing and a plague on you that you won't shut up and let him get on with taking down the song. It's what it means, but it uh, rhymes with the, with the line that went before it, as most of you would have noticed it. Eh? So, Dermot says, if I were writing for a month, I wouldn't have described all of Michal's exploits. And that was the end of that um, entry in the... Uh, St. Patrick's. On the 28th of June of the same year, 1902, another song of George's was printed in St. Patrick's. A band was uh, formed under the leadership of Jack Desmond from Dangan the Salach. Jack was sometimes known as the Whale, and this band began to play in Clondrahod village. The same band is mentioned again in uh, the song, The Farewell to, to Creed and the Runner, that we will be hearing later on, I am confident. Um, now, there's a, a loose verse that we came across further on, and I, I, can't, I, I haven't got the rest of the, the song yet, but it referred to a, a seizure of putteen that took place down in Dang and the Salah years later. And the same man, Jack Desmond the Whale, came into it again, and the only bit of it I have so far is four lines, and it said, The sergeant came and cut the whale, and Jimmy Donahue too, and Buckley to the judge he swore he knew nothing of the mountain Jew. So, Two references to Jack Desmond that I've got so far anyway, and um, we'll get back to the first one. Um, when referring to the village of Clondrahud, as distinct from the parish, George pretty much always calls it an Chaituch. When I gave a lecture on George's poetry at Aegshi Yermidi Hulivan in December, I made a suggestion about the origin of the name an Chaituch. But I discussed it since with uh, Michael Kelleher, um, from the village there, and uh, Dennis O'Connell, and I've come to the conclusion that I was wrong on that occasion, and that the name is connected with Ka, the Irish word for chaff. There was a flour mill in the village since the end of the 17th century, at one time owned by the Dennehy family, who later gave their name to Dennehy's Cross in Cork City. There can be no doubt that there'd be plenty of chaff to be got around the village. The word Ka took itself at one time meant a winnowing sheet, but that meaning didn't, doesn't seem to have survived in um, the dialect of the, the neighbourhood in the present century anyway. But it's possible that some wit compared the village to a winnowing sheet because to be covered with chaff. In any case, the local tradition is very strong on the point that the word is connected with chaff. And if we want to say precisely how, I'm afraid we're into the realm of speculation. Uh, I inquired about the air of this song, and I failed to come across it. Uh, if anybody listening would happen to know it, I'd like to hear all about it. Uh, in the meantime, I found that it kind of fits fairly well into uh, the tune of a jig um, called, a very common jig called Tather Jack Welsh. And uh, I'm going to sing it to that tune, uh, because nobody else this day knows um, how to sing it any better. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, that I know of, anyway, if they do, let me know. Uh, I'm not saying it's very good, it's just the best you're going to get. <laughs> um, whatever about the tune, the words are fine anyway, so as I say, if anyone can come up with the proper tune, so much the better, and uh, I think it'd be a bit of a shame if the song were to die out. <clears throat> no. Uh. <laughs> Undiluted water. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> A 
Erudan Garo to the head and Gartig with the Noska, Artig Father Giring, the drunk that less gurgles flute and a shed in Shingim with Elho, Cathedrum being, the Padoli Han, the Gualstaller and the Stane, for Paul the Gartnote, the Hjold Lanunt. We show some cartonic near for can on the tien of Rokan, a rock road beer shoe. Canto to be Yokub, whom when you taught you, the Hifanska or Lokovaskaboon, the Stalagon Hall of Mahe Mohr, the Bishop King of the Christian Throne, the Bishop the Sword Brad, the Higan Morco. The Sihan and Hobbes got blooded and deemed the Marig and Gairvin of Holofin State, the Bishop Nahin to the Ronnie Field. The Vic Passen Shon, the Varti and all, nor is Kane tears the part of the Machti de Schling, the Lagagan Hartug, the Strohan the Cartis, Boberg Martion, Marty Ronin. The cut bright power, the critical score is to a checker bone, the big mohtonat. Near reti glolish is to shake him bohir, a madden grobo, a gorse to an ishtal. Poh hat bragan don't have anything, he goes down on the crown of the grom of his glishin of rain. The shearum when he knows just no good. Die Schnachte nur Brune geschlossen und wink. Durch eine Stehne und Greifsche Haare, Schöne Gekur, doch hat ich ihn schnapp, doch auch nicht feif. Goh, Gürch und Schäde, Schör, Merhol, Enges, Nach, Hand und Schäfene, und dann mit der Dutsch geint. Goh, dein Fähne, ich anwucht, ist so ruch und Kasse. Doch hat der Mokante zwischen den Scherjöf, Maar kruk en fane, wat dan gaat u? Nu beter haar zalen dan met u te ziel. Maar vroon, maar dan kien, maar gaat braad haar schiert, is peil ik haar tijd is, na veel ik gebrak. Is troon haar als schint, ver hoobak is niet, daar er kalsig om pimpel, wie ons het aan vraag. The winter heart is shed through the light of the earth, the sun flying at the high next to tears. The road to the sun stays at the sun, the sun is in the light, the light is the moon, the sun is in the light. It's my dear, my dear, like one of an Arctic, my wife in the sun is to make an imprint. In all the fun of the world is so hard to the end we fight it out here from three. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, there are the words. If someone has the tune, as I say, talk to me before I go. Um, on the 2nd of May 1903, two sons arrived together. Another song in Irish, um, the slogan like "Ir er ir knucht na lawn." The only and the only proper bilingual song by George that I know of. Um, one of his masterpieces, "The Pop Came Home from Playdoch. At the 1994 Irachtas in Dungarvan, only Mikey O'Sullivan from Coolie told me that he heard of a song George composed about the making of a road. This was the only trace I found um, of any memory of the song. The place where the road was being made is given as Knucknalan, and I suppose that this is um, Knucklalan, just uh, west of Labuyer, but I don't, uh, I, I suppose it could easily be just as well be taken as the hills of Alans, but since there is a place named uh, Knucklalan in the place, it's, it's probably there, but maybe, uh, maybe somebody could tell me before I go where they were building a road in 1902, and I might be able to sort the matter out. Anyway, one or the other. There isn't a scrap of information in St. Patrick's about it. Um, uh, and I don't, and as I say, nobody sings the song, but this time I think the air is pretty straightforward, because it looks, just to look at the song anyway, you 
couldn't imagine whether that would be sung to the air of Johnny Norrie's song, um, Bill's Gander. So I'm going to make a shape at this again. I don't know it as well as the last one, but I'll make a, a, a quick shape at it and I won't hold you long before you get some... Um, before only Mike, he'll sing you the, the, my pop came home from play, if, if we can track him down in a few minutes. Um, here it is anyway. <coughs> Peace looking like it is, it is looking long. Got far gone for so good to go to the wrong. I think I've taken that time. Oh, in sheen of my boy, a gourd of the port of the clay, shot me the sleeves, moye, the talk of a gambling. Lering it is good. The brug is the British of our file, nor a winky my fod, the hog of the Neller and Isle. The pick or the gear on my letter, August Pirala, who August Yinmur train the young and argue. Bena de Burini eared the rumble crum, his crackle and schnell, nor bed leg, a yarrow gun to up. After the third day, all of us do over to the summer. Nine and five, Pershing fact, Chevson or Peter Gideon. We may have a two more, as do she is all so green. Skin and look she for, go home and no care we. The hand is the muscle, so walk and be on the wind. Team Polaim should be a good tract as ever be. Be crowed all in she weird in the room snow. She art to go on in she, he's in the moon home. Far car the part of Graver man in the field. A lean of the cart is near after an endless hill. The hook on the teaching is the hills near Ashton name. The barley deon is teen to hook on shing the hay. The beon go flush of toil, over to go toil, ling agus leap, agus brain of a toad, the hook of the scum and the cream. That's all the stir that again. <laughs> Not, not quite as good as the, the, the Kartik song, I, I think, but it's, 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 it's reasonable enough. Um, Dear Madola, it gives this background information about the, my pup came home from Cleidu. Um Here's another sod for the Tinakoska from Mihal. A cowherd from Cleidu, he says, took a sheepdog from this townland during the year, but that didn't do him much good because the dog didn't stay with him. He came home again after a short time. Michal made this song about the Jagin. I hope people won't file forward with it because it's partly in English. Dear Madalera was very wary about naming anyone in the songs. In this case, he was trying to hide the identity of the man that the pup ran away from. In the published version, instead of Kankati, the, the proper name, he calls him Moriarty. And he wasn't a cowherd, he was a farmer. He had a son that was known as Farished because he was lived in the farthest inn house in Claydoch. There's no exit by a road um, on the eastern side of Claydoch. He had a son who used to be interviewed in Irish and in English on the radio by Padraig Tyres in the 70s. I remember myself one time, Padraig Tyres, he was living in the house and he, when he was getting a small bit old, he moved out to about three fields of the main road and he, when Padraig Tyres called him, he said to him, um, and Eugene was a witty man like that. He moved into Killarney at the end of his life, and I'd say he died maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, so he was, and, and when he died, it was actually announced on Radio on the Gael that he was a grandson of the of Con Cathy mentioned in, 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 in the song My Pop Came Home From Claydoch. I remember Sean O'Keeva announcing it on the on the, the local, on the North of Deshkirt and Radio on the Gael Tifta. Um, Matty Black gave Sean O'Cronin a small little bit more um, information on the, the story of the composing of the, the song. He said George was working with one of the Larrys at Clondrahud when he composed the song about the dog. 
"'Twas after nightfall and they were inside by the fire when they heard the noise at the door. One of them opened it and what should come in, only the doggy in, and he looking like death warmed up. <laughs> they were amazed at how he made his way home. They were after giving him to McCarthy and Clay took some time before that. The man of the house said to George that he should make a song about it, and he started on it straight away. So if only Mikey's anywhere there, maybe he'd start on it straight away. <laughs> Man on it. <laughs> and my pup came home from Clare today, and I am glad of it. Concarty didn't treat him as decent as he promised him. The Vyukshe Mokus de Mokuiger of Nishaskahe. The hang the river, no say ye go vago ask the snark me vi gomoraloch nor han she And if you were to see him, twas really astonishing what little time a sheep dog without feeding wouldn't be vanishing. Near of Shul Nishli, on Mukri, and the clear we at her, a Hosvi Tani, his feeb should be grad his knock, maybe Gomorra, nor Han is she And he was so very lonesome, his throat got sore with sadness. One morning, ere the walk, sure his chain he broke with madness. The yarshe trees the conger le brought to the natuk she tree lount of his tree work nick. Bogol at nas that of she snuck maybe gomoral nor han is she and he was so very homesick, the bones were poking through his skin, and that being somewhat torn, it could do no more than hold him in. The Vishetir Shaknati, Ganahus Nadul Meir, spoke over the Vibati, is Segwalti Ahachum Gair. Snach me vi gomoraloch, nor han is she walchum. And his feeding whilst out there was small praties mixed in stir about. He could run all over Cleduch with party of them in his mouth. The be slow ro in shakorer. Nor of dot in no lag he, near of cusses and the go down, nor all look to shoot knag his knock, maybe come or all look, nor han is she welcome. And he'd leave no rat or mouse in the house, but he'd surely maul, and if he would break loose. He'd go bouncing through a double wall. We bukhachter van him pan shuk, nur yark shen shekidur, o dardik su su wali, is asko brakuk nikinur, is dak mebi gomoral, dorahan is shel and his adventures whilst out there, they will yet go down in history. But how he got away will forever remain a mystery. And those black and burn ranges of Claydock sure they're terrible. There's vast three thousand acres, and stairs and acres are rubble. Neil Onach Atten Gaelog, Frechagus Portehe, 
da me fa me hon de nach bo weil och dort we gort he snach me wi gomoral och nur han ich schepp weil ich um komm mal One of George Curtin's masterpieces, <laughs> and masterfully rendered there by Oni as well. The, the, a small problem with it is that a hell of a collection. Connections has been the first half and the second half of the verse, so they tend to be a bit interchangeable, and then you can run out of the second half or system from time to time. It's happened to all of us, I said. But uh, rendered with spirit, fair play, Oni. <laughs> um, Um, there was just one other song of George's published in St. Patrick's, and the reason that they, they stopped was that dear Midolaire had left the area and taken up his job as travelling teacher from the McCroom, under the McCroom Regional Committee. The area he covered seemed to stretch east from McCroom. George in this song mentions Bering's tomes and Kilmurray. In any case, dear Mid wrote two verses to George in the form of a letter asking for news um, and how were his neighbours and relations and George obliged with four verses to the same pattern. This was an old tradition among um, uh, 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 Irish poets and frequently practised by the 18th century poets in Musgury. The two verses that Diarmid sent and the answer were published in, on the 22nd of August 1904. Sarna Mona introduced the poetry in, this, uh, in the following way. I received from County Cork some verses which Dear Midolaire wrote to his friend Michal Otoma. Dear Mid uses a nickname when addressing Michal. The nickname was Shorshan Kurtanig, um, an Irish version of George Curtin that had been used by George himself previously in the Carter song. So, um, I've often heard it said that George didn't like the, that he actually didn't like the, the, the name George Curtin, that he preferred to be called uh, Mike Toomey, but uh, he doesn't seem to have any objection to using it himself anyway, so he can't have been too troubled about it back in 1902 or 03 in any case. Um, no, uh, the last time we, when I did the, the version of this uh, talk in, in Irish at the Akshi Yermidi Hulivan, uh, we had Eilish Nihulivan there and she sang the song. Um, the tune of it is the same tune as Cathy Irmid in the barn and, and um, I made a great shape to learn it from a tape I took a violin at the time but I, I, I haven't actually succeeded <laughs> so I think we're just going to have to more or less uh, leave it I'd say would I ever see now I, I'm, I'm going to attempt it. I expect I'll peter out in the first half of the first verse. I just not just don't, not at all sure of this tune. Um. Say your shin khurtani near clashes of ran wait and dust it now. No, I can't do it really, I just lost it. I expected this was going to happen. Sorry about that. Um, just, uh, just basically, as I said, a kind of a, a letter going forwards and backwards. And uh, the only, an interesting matter that, uh, well, two things he mentions in it. He says, is gone which is better left in the original Irish, I'd say, than trying to translate it. Um, <laughs> Uh, to a possible translation is senile, but it doesn't always imply all the ages. But Marine Shincheski has a couple is the, the the reason he used for this. And the uh, second one is that they straightened Gryrimer Bohri Glana that they was they straightened out the Glandav Road. So these are two uh, events that happened in 1903, according to this account. Anyway, in the song as well, Diarmuid inquired about George's mother. So that means we must, that we know she was alive in August 1903. Um, according to the census of 1901, herself and George were living in the cottage um, at Liz Carragan Cross. There's no account of her in the census of 1911. Um, 
and after her death, George went to live with Tom Corkery and his wife, Ellen, in Baritanachnik. So this account in August 1903, this mention of her in August 1903, is the last um, mention of her that I know of um, after 1901 and forever after, really. So she must have died sometime between August 1903 and um, 1911. That's the, what's to be gathered from that. Mihalo Brien, a uh, school teacher and one of the Balivurna Four Masters, who were thanked and named in the introduction of Father Deneen's famous Irish dictionary, had collected a considerable number of songs and uh, Pronchez O'Calla, or Frank Kelly, a uh, farmer and teacher from Shanafloin in Balivurna, made a list of them but didn't transcribe them. He sent the list to the Irish Folklore Commission, now the Department of Irish Folklore in University College Dublin. The list is still in the archive and was brought to my attention by Cormac Cohe of Coolay, who is down there somewhere, holding up the bar, I think. Um, uh, Cormac is um, doing some research on Frank Kelly's song collection. The list includes two songs by George that are otherwise unknown. They are A Year Mid Storig and Machlachas Machas. These titles, which make up the half of the first lines of the songs, is all we now have of them. And I think we'd be lucky to discover the complete words of them at this stage. It is interesting that one of them, again, is addressed to Diarmid, and there can be little doubt, but that Diarmid all there is the man in question. On Tahir Padr used to write articles in Irish for a journal called The Leader, and these articles were later gathered up into a, bo a book um, entitled Skavuola. On Tahir Padr recommended that young people from the Gaeltuk be scattered around the country to teach Irish. The articles took the form of a discussion between Tayag and Dunacha. On the 2nd of May 1903, one of these articles was entitled Nihala Tuoma, and it finished up like this. Dunacha says, I'm thinking that if there were a fine Irish speaker in every townland, somebody like Nihala Tuoma, for example, the man who made the song about the gander and the other song about the shoes, um, that every one of the 50 people would have a chance to hear as much Irish as they wanted, not just when they were gathered in the classroom, but every hour of the day. And Tayug says, there's no doubt about it. Nihala Toma has better and truer and richer Irish than I ever came across from any scholar. Irish will have to be learned from the likes of him. The sooner they will be sent out teaching it, the better. Every now and again for a time after that, George is mentioned as an example of the young Irish speaker from the Gaeltacht, who has great linguistic riches to share with the rest of the country. And Tahir Padr firmly believed that Irish couldn't be learned properly without hearing it from native speakers. The School of Irish Learning was being set up at this time in Dublin to train Irish scholars. And Tahir Padr was doing his best to see to it that the spoken language, Kaint Nanina, as he called it, wouldn't be neglected. And that people like Michal Thoma would be sent, um, would be there to teach proper Irish to the scholars. A person like Michal Thoma is the phrase he uses in all these articles, so that although George was mentioned and was getting publicity, there's no real information about him. The last reference to him is on the 20th of June 1903 in an article entitled Is Ulkan Hark na Schrieben de Fein? Tis a bad hen wouldn't scratch for herself. For George's English songs, and I'm going to move now to the English songs, we have three main sources. Firstly, there's living tradition. John O'Connell of Alans, in particular, had a great number of George's English songs. That they didn't die with him is clear from the singing and the singers that we've heard and are still to hear this evening. Secondly, there are some of George's English songs and some interesting commentary on them in volume 737 in the Department of Irish Folklore. Um, and thirdly, another written source has recently come to attention some English songs written in San Francisco by William J. Creedon, a son of Jerry Creedon the Myler. A photocopy of this manuscript was contributed by Johnny Creedon, a relative of Williams, who is proprietor of the halfway house at the Mons. I'll begin with the account in the Department of Irish Folklore of the song Jerfoley's Boat. Apart from George's brother, Matty Black, Sean O'Croneen, also called to Dear Medineen, who lived in Drummondhilla, Mill Street. Diarmid was originally from Balivour in a parish, but I haven't been able to discover what town land he was from. I suspect it might have been Shanna Um 
He was a great expert at tracing, as it was known locally, and that, that is putting in relations. Sean O'Croyne gives the following account from him about the making of Jerry Bo Foley's boat. Jerry Foley lived in Discargan. He was a low-sized fat man. One summer's day he went out saving hay in an inch by the Fahurish River. An otter came out of the river and Jerry ran after him with a pike to stab him. Naturally he had no look. He was old and heavy. This happened back in Bara Tanachnik. George Curtin heard the story and composed the song about it. The strange thing about that account is it makes no mention of the boat. Um, on the tape, the, of, um, a tape of John O'Connell's um, renderings of some of uh, George Curtin's songs, he gives an account of somebody that Jerry was expressed an interest in boating and that somebody suggested him to go into this. Um, what Danny Mikey told me the last time I was around was a, a what do you call it, a, an enamel dish, yes that's it. And now it wasn't an animal, it was uh, some kind of tin galvanized dish, that's it. Uh, <laughs> galvanized dish that was made by a tinker, but um, he got into this anyway and sailed down a bit and fell and uh, a bit capsized in no time at all. Um, Jerry scrambled ashore on here, but uh, according to what Danny told me, the dish went missing for three weeks. Now, what I don't, the funny thing about the two of these accounts is that Sean O'Cronin gives the account of the author. And John O'Connell gives the account of the dish completely separately. And whether it was actually George Curtin um, linked the two together and made the song, or whether the two, whether he actually went hunting the otter in the boat, I don't know. It may be Danny himself, you know. And he's going to come up now, I hope, and sing the song. <laughs> and um, If uh, any of the other um, singers, by the way, have any extra information to add about the songs, I'd be only delighted to learn something new about them. Because uh, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, local information around here that I haven't picked up yet. Go ahead, Danny. Well, I, I tell you, my author for it is Danny Willio. He, 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 knew, he knew jazz curtain, but... Um, he told me it was, it was uh, the boat was it was a galvanized dish that was made by a tinker and it was used for washing clothes by the women and, 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 and there was no hot pint automatic that time I suppose was it? <laughs> but, but he, he took the boat he took the dish to go after the author and he um, the first, the first uh, turn he met in the river, he ate a rock and he got capsized and the dish went, the dish took off down the river and he, and he gave it a week searching for it. That's how it comes into the song. He was three weeks away, but that wasn't long. And I'm told that your folly went out yesterday and that in Shoud and Crimmins was saving some hair. Being close by the river he went for a drink and now what did he see there? Now what do you think? Rally ruffle the door, rally ruffle there. A big water dog was lying close to the bank. He went for a pike for to drive in his flank. When the water dog saw him, he took to his heels. If you saw him, you'd swear it was the devil on wheels. Rally ruffle the da, rally ruffle the deer. Then Jerry got mad and he took off his coat. He went for a hatchet to build him a boat. He loaded his rifle with a bundle of hat, and he swore by the Pope he would give him his debt. Rally ruffle the da, rally ruffle the dead. Then he jumped in his boat and he started to run. The people that saw him. They said it was a show that he wasn't drowned, 
for the boat wasn't strong. He was three weeks away, but sure that wasn't long. Rally raffle, the da, rally raffle, the dear. As he drew near the island, there sprang up a gale. He had to haul down both his jib and men sail. The corn being high and the tide it being strong, sure he climbed up a pole, saying, I live while I can, Ralira, fall the da, Ralira, fall the He clung to the main mast and held it up straight. The power of invention it cannot be bad. The storm soon came, then Jerry came down, and he hitched up his riggings to take him to town. Rally raffle the day, rally raffle the day. He then steered his vessel with judgment and skill, directing his course by the moon and the hill. He labored and bravely for saving his life. For himself and that woman named John, that's his wife, Rally Raffal, the da, Rally Raffal, the day. As he passed by the bridge, she appeared like a mage. The people that saw him, they said it wasn't him. His head, it was bare, and his mouth, it was big. And he hadn't got hair, no, not even a rib. Rally raffle, the da, rally raffle, the <laughs> Then at Carrigafook, he struck a big rock. And the noise that it made, sure, it gave him a shock. For the boards, they were rotten and gone to decay. And the kick it gave back, drove the bottom away. Rally raffle, the da, rally raffle, the When he found he was shipwrecked, he started to bawl. You'd hear him ten miles if you'd hear him at all. He swore if he'd catch him, he'd bring him to grief. And he called him a scoundrel, a dastard and thief. Rally raffle, the da, rally raffle, the Then there did this big vessel come into Kinsale. The captain, he heard of this wonderful tale. He called to see Jory that very same night. When he saw him, he surely crawled with the light. Rally raffle, the da, rally raffle, the dear. He offered him silver, he offered him gold. He offered him numberless things, I am told. He offered him lands and a mansion quite free, if he'd only consent. To go with him to see Rally Raffle, the da, Rally Raffle, the day. Now, Jory is a man who is easy and quiet. He saluted the captain and bade him good night. Sang the last time I sailed in that boat of my own, I went near going to hell or to heaven from John. Rally raffle, the da, rally raffle, the air. Then the captain, his temper, he tried to control. He didn't say much, but he said, Pan my soul. I came to see you all the way from Kinsale, and allow me to tell you I'm not going to fail. Rally raffle, the da, rally raffle, the dear. Then John, she got cross and she started to scold, for you know she is wicked and terrible bold. She finished in Irish, the crotch at the scale. There was hail at the wacky gun, Hanuman deal. Rally raffle, the da, rally raffle, the Mighty good, Danny. <laughs>
The next uh, song I'm going to come to is the Mick Sullivan's Clock, and according to my extensive notes here, the, the man that's going to sing it is Cahal O'Connell, uh, son of Connie O'Connell, the famous, uh, the, the, the famous fiddler from Kielamatra. He can be kind of gathering his way up slowly. I've got a bit to say about it. Um, okay. This is the account, anyway, that uh, Sean O'Cronin got about this from uh, Dear Medingin. George had a neighbour, he said, whose name was Mick Sullivan. He, he had an old clock and there was something wrong with it. It would sometimes start striking and it would carry on for a good long time. He, it was bothering Mick. Several people were trying to fix the clock and it was failing him. Mick asked George to try and fix it. One day they were digging potatoes for a farmer in the neighbourhood. George and Mick and the boss were all digging together. George was humming to himself during the day and he composed the song by degrees like that. Mick didn't realise what he was doing. George sang the song when he had it finished. Um, Mick Sullivan was uh, from this Carragain. Um, and I think here's Cahal all ready to, to go. So um, we let the ta song talk for itself. Another, uh, another great song, really. One of the, another, one of the, one of the masterpieces. <laughs> The hot clock of Mick Sullivan down by the bog And gave up keeping time since it turned and grog And got a bad habit of drinking strong wine And it often struck it when it should have struck nine Rally fall the die darly darly dee It often struck nine when it should have struck it and it often struck twelve when it wasn't so late. It often broke out in the dead hour of night and hauled hammering away till the clear morning's light rally fall the day, darly, darly, dee. When it went to the devil, then Mick took it down. He tackled the gin and to take it to town. To have it repaired by a man from Tralee But that very same day he was out on the spree Rally fall the day, darly, darly, dee He had it fixed up by a man in Pound Lane But on taking it home it went nearly insane It struck every man on the road that they met And I'm told that it nearly struck Mickle to death Rally fall the day, darly, darly, dee. It stopped one fine day, it was the month of July. And anyone that saw it, they couldn't tell why. But those that did live near him, they said that it hopped by the flag of the fireplace and suddenly stopped. Rally fall the day, darly, darly, dee. When Dan heard it stopped, he came home that same night. He, he caught it and wound it up terrible tight. He brushed out the dust and he straightened the hands and he tightened the screws with the paws of the tongs. Rally fall the day, darly, darly, dee. He then hung it up on a sixpenny nail. To smash it with something they call it a flail. When I went for to stop him, he told me look out, and he said he would break it without any doubt. Rally fall the day, darly, darly, dee. But the clock jumped the ditch and it made for Knuckwee. It climbed up on top of a hawthorn tree. Mick went to the tree with a stick and a frown and he called on the clock telling it to come down rally fall the day darly darly dee he then called on John and he made a big shout to gather a bell or some sort of crowd and those that had them could bring with them sticks and sure those that could not could break it with kicks, rally fall the day, darly, darly, dee. The whole crowd did soon gather the tear of the thor, with some of them cursing, while more of them swore. 
But the clock tumbled down and rolled into the water, and I never did hear what became of it after. Rally fall did I dare and I dare and I did. <laughs> Lovely, Cahal. <laughs> um, I have a good long account here from Sean O'Croyne uh, that he got from Dear uh on the song The Man That Came Home From Pretori. And I think the man uh, that's going to sing it is Colm O'Cohe, but uh, you've got, I'd say you've got a, about five minutes, I'd say, judging by the length of this account. <laughs> um, This is what uh, Dearmouth said about it. George was a labourer all of his life, he said, and he used to drink a drop. He was quite poor. He used to go to McCroom to buy clothes for himself now and again. And when he had a drop taken, he used to forget the business that brought him there and land home without a bit. He had an aunt in Cardiff, and George often went over there. In the end, she left him some money. He went over and drank all the money. He wanted to come home then, but he hadn't a penny in his pocket. There was no boat going to Cork, but he found uh, a vessel going to Dundalk. He met another man from Kerry who was coming home as well. He was as badly off as George himself. They worked their passage on board ship. They landed at Dundalk on the 1st of November. The captain was going to send them off in the morning. They had no bread and the captain sent someone to buy some in the morning. He came back and said there was no bread to be gotten in Dundalk. George heard them and spoke to the captain. I'll go and see, can I get some if you like? He said, the captain gave him permission and off he went. He got the bread, plenty of it, and came back. After that, George and the carryman struck off and got as far as Drogheda. George was thinking that if he got as far as Inchicore, he'd get work uh, at the ironworks. Um, but they hadn't a copper. George thought of a plan. He had a good singing voice and he sang a song the youth that belonged to Milltown there in Drogheda. The carryman went around with his hat and he gathered up six pounds from the locals. They stayed in Drogheda that night and came as far as Dublin the following day. The carryman went home from there. George went to Wicklow and southwards. He used to spend a while working with farmers here and there. He arrived home around the Christmas and made the song. He pretended that he was in Pretoria. It was clear that the Boer War must have been on, that, that there was the Diamond Dean's account. It was clear anyway that the Boer War must have been on, or at least just over at the time the song was composed. Uh, Connie Welch of Glowndav told me that George was away for a year, or maybe two years, and that his mother used to be complaining that he left her alone. Uh, the Boer General, Christian Rudolf De Witt, um, who is mentioned in some versions of the song, came to prominence after Kruger had left for Europe in February 1900. And for 15 months after that, he really carried the fight to the British forces. We know that George was back in uh, Corilia, or the Rilia, or, or the border between the two, uh, in any case, um, between November 1901 and August 1903, when Dermot O'Leary was having his Irish songs published in St. Patrick's. So I think it must have been Christmas 1900, when he returned from Cardiff and composed the man that came home from Pretoria. So maybe if Cormac is ready, he'd come and give us a blast. <laughs> Although I have travelled far over the seas, my clothes they are tattered and flying in the breeze. They got me entangled in brambles and trees on my way coming home from Pretorium. The long hours in ambush while dodging the balls in anguish we languish while patching our souls. Sure, three of those men was a match for three score of the English force in Pretorium. I work like a bugger to come back again on board no lugger. Home from Pretoria. Yeah, right. 
third party dancing and we came to Dundalk My limbs are aching, I scarcely could walk And the fever were watching with the eye of a hawk And this man coming home from Pretorin there was one with a squinty insisted to know my name and my way of existing also. And he said, You're the gimp, an identical go of a man coming home from Praetorium. I was then. I prayed and protested with tears in my eyes For the sake of his death that had fled to the skies Not to rush me, but let me pass by On my way coming home from Praetorium I was then marched away like a horse off to pound with two other stragglers chained and well bound Should I rather be swallowed red hot through the ground Or shot by the boars in Praetorium I haven't a wrap in this sack I alone I broke into no shop and I started no row I stole no gold watch, no clock or a coal, but I am tramping it home from Praetorium. I'll tell you where was it they locked me that night. It was a dreary stone closet set out from the light, where the bogs in battalion was having great fight. For this man coming home from Praetorium. Now I'm back in Stikin with my friends in the fall. In the nettest of places that ever you saw. In the spotiest spot from all home to go gone. There ain't sleep till my Fish girls grow hoary. Yeah, the Cormac. Another fine song there by George, I think. One of the best. Um, the. The man name for the next song is a bit closer to, to home, I suppose. Uh, Dennis Lucy, Clown the Hood, so if he's anywhere there, would he be gathering himself somewhere close to it? <laughs> um, in 1906, uh, Jerry Creedon, the runner, a good friend of George's, and um, a brother to Mary Jane, that was Ted Sweeney's wife, and Ted Sweeney was uh, George's best friend. Um, he emigrated for San Francisco. George composed the song, The Farewell of Creedon the Runner, to mark the sad event. Um, most of the neighbours around were mentioned in it. This is about the only song uh, that, uh, that I know um, of George's that was composed in a serious vein. Um, nearly all the others have uh, a fairly good element of humour in them, I think. So uh, is Dennis there anywhere? <laughs> Man, Dennis. Heartbreaking bring sorrow, I'll now have to go and leave my own folk behind me. Or to think of my doom, sure my poor heart gets low, and I'll weep till the tears nearly blind me. For now I must cross o'er the wild raging foam and leave my dear parents, my country and home. O oh, true hearted comrades with whom I use roam. No more at Williams you'll find me. And as I am leaving upon you I call, 
to pray for my welfare and safety. Shane Cruhur, now I bid you farewell, Johanna Cruhur and Jula as well. And Nora that's lately come into the dell, goodbye to both clergy and lady. Goodbye, Johnny Yan, I must leave you at last. No more will we speak of the city. Goodbye to your wife and Jersey, your son, to your daughters, Mag, Hannah and Kitty. No more will I speak of the wrongs of our isle. No more will I enter that field for a mile. No more will we sing or dance on the green hills of Erin's green isle. But I've met comrades light-hearted and witty. Goodbye to you, Donald, and John too, and Jack. Goodbye to your three loving daughters. Of health and of happiness, I hope you don't lack when I'm far away o'er the waters. Farewell to my comrades, both present and past. No wonder, indeed, I feel sad and downcast. I must now take a seat very close to the mast among fodden wild harsh gladiators. Goodbye, Dennis O'Shea, I must leave you at last, and likewise your wife, Helen Haley. Goodbye to your children who are rising up fast. May prosperity shine on you daily. Goodbye to your lion heart, Johnny Matche, that you and your wife and your children, I pray, May enjoy health and concord when I'm far away from the friends I leave weeping and wailing. Farewell to the dear friends I had in my day, Ted Sweeney and Peter and Connie Shawnee, and daring Con Connell who held six at bay the day that we played a hubble. The train steams away from the station at last, and I part from my own lads and lasses. I care not for billards, for playing chess or cards, and devoured against pints and half glasses. I now have to stroll among Johnnies and Jacks, Hebrews and Capers and Tawnies and Blacks. Oh, dearly beloved, no, these are the facts. I'll mix with all creeds and all classes. Shall I ever forget all the games and the sport? In Ireland today I am leaving. While some of my best friends are laid in the grave, the general cause of my grieving. Should I ever forget all the games and the sport, and many good places I used to resort. For gymnastics we did in the noonday when fort, and spent hour after hour then achieving. In the athletic arena where oft I have been, I've met many the light-hearted beggars. The great Alfred Shrub in my rambles I've seen, with Heinen and Daly and others. To athletes and to bandsmen and concertmen too, I bid a most doleful and sorrowing adieu. May God keep us safe from each perilous crew and protect our dear fathers and mothers. Goodbye, Peter, Larry, Dan and Eileen, Jack Sweeney, Tom, Betty and Molly. Mick Sullivan, Matty, Jack Fox and Sixteen, the Lucy's Pat, Nora and Connie. Michael O'Hanna, Michael O'Connell, Margaret Hannah and Tim, the Kellers, Daniel, Jula and Jim. A crowd that's been divided of being hideous or grim, but charming and but honest and zealous and jolly. Goodbye to your parents, the hour is at hand. Goodbye to you, sisters and brother. Adieu to the ever-famed Clondrahead band. Not a man there was ancy air seen to shudder. I'd say it is from Dennis himself that the version we've written down here came because it's nearly the same word for word, so it's just as well. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's, mighty, that's uh, a fair roll call anyway of the, 
the people from from uh, this kind of garden cross up and down it. Uh, <coughs> um, Some uh, excitement came to the neighbourhood about 1910 when uh, Mary Bridget O'Leary returned from America. She was a relation of Antahar Pathers and apparently was of a uh, troublesome disposition. A local teacher, Michael O'Shea, wrote the following account of her in 1915. She describes herself as, as a poor widow. Her poverty is due to her love of litigation. There has scarcely been a case from this quarter at the McCroom bench in which she did not figure either as plaintiff or as defendant. She was bound to the peace on at least two occasions and was obliged to give up her revolver to the police for, for making unlawful use of it. She returned home from America about five years ago, a grass widow if she herself is to be believed, and proved so troublesome to her own brother that he, attributing her violence to insanity, took the steps necessary to consign her to an asylum. The doctor, however, refused to certify her insane, and she is still at large. <clears throat> from, uh, to, to, to make a bit of a jump across the globe, uh, from the second century BC, Port Arthur, in the province of Liaoning in China, was an important trading post because of its strategic position on the Pacific Ocean and the fact that its harbour is never blocked by ice at any time of the year. The reason it's called Port Arthur is because um, speakers of English found it too difficult to pronounce its Chinese name. There was war between the Chinese and the Japanese in uh, 1894 and 95, and as part of the settlement to end it, the Japanese rented Port Arthur from the Chinese. The Western powers weren't happy and returned Port Arthur to the Chinese. The Russians were expanding eastwards and in 1897 captured the Liaotung Peninsula, or Liaoning, where um, Port Arthur is situated. The following year, they leased the peninsula and were given rights to build a railway that would be linked up to the Trans-Siberian. They fortified Port Arthur and established a naval base there. In 1904, a war broke out between the Russians and the Japanese. The Japanese reached um, Liaotung and the Russians withdrew to Port Arthur. The siege that followed lasted six months before the Japanese captured it. George compared some local turmoil caused by Mary Ellen O'Leary to the siege of Port Arthur. Matty Toomey, um, no, not, not George's brother, no totally different, uh, no relation at all, uh, lived at Liscarragon Cross and he became a dairyman up in Glondav. For the younger generation who don't know what a dairyman is, he took cows and land from a farmer for a year, or officially 11 months, and looked after them, but had to hand over to the farmer so much butter and a fixed um, charge per cow as well, known in Irish as Arigadayrk. Um, and I don't know what is known as in English, maybe it is hard money, I don't know. Um, anyway, um, while poor Matty and Eyre was profitably employed in Glondav, Mary Ellen took over his house at Liscarragon Cross and George described the story in the song The, the Siege of Port Arthur. And we've got um, Michael Matty Keller from Clonderhood has promised me he was going to give us a, a bar or two of it, or the whole lot in fact, and here he's come. <laughs> Now you've heard of the siege of Port Arthur, of the terrible slaughter I own, but there's nothing on land or on water to compare to this far of our own. Once I lived quite uncontented in a mansion both spacious and tall. I suppose I was nearly demented for thinking to leave it at all. I suppose twas the limb of all Satan that whispered one day in my ear, saying, Matty, I'm afraid you're mistaken to be wasting your time around here. You've sufficient help for a dairy, so why don't you take one there then? You're haunting this cross like a fairy with a farm to spare in the glen. 
So damn it, I there meditated, revolving the case in my mind. To my sorrow I now must relate it, I left my good neighbours behind. I rushed like a jackass and bolted, right up to that farm in the glen. How I wish that the owner had sold it, or that Ellen Roach remained in. Because from Pat Murphy, a farmer, I heard the most awful sad news that had tumbled me into a corner as if I was after a booze. That Mrs. Mary O'Leary one night invaded my house. The tidings they properly scared me and left me as weak as a mouse. I then rushed by train for some wardens and a monstrous load of police. But Mary left grain go in tatters and scattered the lot like wild geese. She banished each bobby and bailiff and brandished a twin-bladed knife. Tomorrow I'll head for Australia if I can get away with my life. So goodbye to my friends and relations, and also my neighbour so kind. When I'm tramping in far foreign nations, I'll think of you here, do you mind? Then wait <laughs> Um the trouble between uh, Matty and Mary didn't stop there, and uh, George had reason to compose another song about their disagreements uh, called Matty and Mary. Is Michael O'Leary somewhere there handy? <laughs> Michael O'Leary from Clounderhood. Mm-hmm. One of the Barnabies. <laughs> One of the George Peters. <laughs> Oh, you've heard about Mary, who's cross and contrary. Saying, Matt, if you come to exchange a few blows, I'll fight you with wattles, with stick stones and bottles. I fought in more battles than you have got toes. And then Matty grew shaky, without a mistake, he was getting quite weak, what a shame to be whole. And he says, pray excuse me, and oh, don't abuse me, you dare not illy use me, I'm surely too old. Besides, if we wrangled, then I should be strangled, by and by you'd be dangled at the end of a rope. Then the devil who would take you to hell, and he'd beg you without a mistake to who, in spite of the Pope. Then Matty fell silent as Mary grew violent, her tempered and violent was frightful to hear. Or to see Matty hopping, as she went on knapping, there was no use stopping her devil of fear. She blackened and blued him, she properly stewed him. By gosh, when I viewed him, my poor heart fell sore. For the creature was battered, his features were spattered, and his teeth they were scattered all over the floor. It was really astounding the way she kept pounding. Her knocks were resounding while echoes the roar. And John Foley says, damn him, sure why don't he keep from her? She's as bold as a ram and as fierce as a boar. It was really appalling to hear the wretch squalling. And as he was falling, he called for police. When we tried to defend him, he cried, she cried, devil meant him. Tonight I will end him, and then we'll have peace. <laughs> well, his dog moved behind her, sure we thought he'd not mind her. Malone, sure he'd blind her without much delay. And he kept her quite busy, till Mary got dizzy. And Matt, by this time, he had clear got away. As homeward he stumbled, he groaned and he grumbled. His clothes and he... Bundled and made for the train. 
Well, he made his escape for to the man the same shepherd I've seen in the peppers he landed in Spain. And so, Matt, no, oh, my darling, on advice, don't be scorning. Don't come back a darling old haunts anymore. For Mary will fix you, just prayer how she nicks you. She properly he licked you when your visage she tore. For you took her so easy for acting so lazy. You must have been crazy with your brain in the fog. For in spite of her resistance, she didn't your existence. But for the assistance you got from the dog. Right. <laughs> Good man, Michael. Um, the story. There was a story following that song that uh, Mary Bridget got to hear about um, George's composition, and wasn't uh, well. She went to intercept him on his way home from work. Um, she told him she heard that she was mentioned in a song of his and produced the famous revolver and asked George to sing the song for her. <laughs> uh, George looked down the barrel of the gun and decided the original song wasn't uh, appropriate for the occasion. <laughs> and he altered the verses as he was going along, um, encouraged with the prospect of a bullet in the forehead. And he started off, now you've all heard the Mary, she's gay and she's airy. And he um, doctored it all the way along until in the end anyway, she says, well, it's a real nice song about her. And she thanked him for his, um, for praising her up and, and left him go home. <laughs> mm. um, this uh, it, it seems to be mainly recited as a recitation. This Patsy and Tate is an account of a dispute, either real or imaginary, between um, Timsey Haigon O'Sullivan from Bar of and uh, as far as I can make out, a man by the name of Paddy White that was working at Sullivan's at the time. Timsey Haigon was uh, related to M and P O'Sullivan's the, of the tobacco business in Cork. I'm uh, reliably informed by Michael Keller, who was down there. I think it was anyway. So there he is. Okay, um, Paddy Corkery, um, a grandson of to, uh, Tom Corkery from Baratana. I he was going to recite this for me. Is he in the vicinity? <laughs> Patient here. Patient here. Patsy and Tate were the greatest of friends until Patsy started making grim faces at him. Are you rascal, said Tate to Patsy, and what is Tim to you now? And like two clocking hens, they started a row. Says Tate to Patsy, your old face I will spoil because I give you a paste that will straighten your broil. When it comes to abuse, we'll see who will have best trump. For the top of my boot, I'll use a new rump. Then the two started shouting and fighting like hell until Patsy struck Ted with a stone and he fell. There lay poor Ted in the ground with a tear in his head and the crowd gathered around saying, Be Jeffers, he's dead! Now when Patsy heard this, he turned and he ran. Toss Connie Sean here took chase like a man. Up Bardeen Hill he, read, he ran like a hare but Connie caught up to him going down strong again. <laughs> down to the man's cross they ran like the wind. Erusha, Shani and Bland, they're out of their mind. But then Patsy gave Shani the devil's own stroke. Every tooth in his jaw and for him he broke. He jumped the salon and he headed up for the pub. He told Maya to pour out a test corn in a tub. Then he drank a few gallons, and off I declare, sure he lashed poor old Connie back near Kinmare. <laughs> the crowd gazed on Ted with a tear in his sconce. He was laid in a dray, and he was taken off to Sean France. Sean was the local doctor, you know. Old Sean, he shook his head, and he looked very wise, saying, Give me an all and thread, girls and boys. 
He's in very bad shape with that wound in his head. But if I know my tate, he'll sure soon rise from the dead. I'll fix up that scar in a short space of time. So he mixed up a plaster of sawdust and lime. Should have Sean got a pound and a jorum of putty in. He'd head mix, he'd head mind the sound as a brown callihane. Some say that all this was in May it occurred. No, it was on Fool's Day, and you can take my word. <laughs> I went away then. Thank you. <laughs> Man, Paddy. <laughs> <laughs> um. Um. Mickey is uh, Mihala Kalla there, Mickey is there, alright, good. Um, this is this about uh, Conley Hands Department card. After the founding of the Free State, there was a, seemed to be a, some kind of a policy of improving agriculture. And Conley Han at uh, uh, participated in a Department of Agriculture scheme uh, for growing vegetables and received some card, but the card, he didn't hold on to the card very long, I'm afraid. And the story is all in the song anyway, and um, Michal will give us a, a bar of it, I imagine. <laughs> I the son of um, Frank Kelly or Pranche Shaw Callow that we mentioned earlier on there that uh, Colin McCohey is working on his a massive collection of songs that he made from the from the belt from Bellevue area and from further afield maybe. <laughs> I am feeling rather hot, said the, shan said the poor old man. <laughs> About the stealing from my plot, said the poor old man. I vow to the Lord, someone principal blackguard has stole away my card, said the poor old man. Now you say this, you tell me this is true, said the Shan Van Vogt. I believe no one but you, said the Shan Van Vogt. If you give me half a crown, then your statement I'll take down, and we'll take it straight to town, said the Shan Van Vogt. Now this is how it goes, said the poor old man. I had drumhead there in rows, said the poor old man. I had lettuce, beans and peas, and some promising young trees and the dainty hive of bees said the poor old man last night was dark as pitch said the poor old man and i thought i had the itch said the poor old man i went out to scratch my back when i heard this awful crack it was the breaking of the stack said the poor old man Back in I ran in fright, said the poor old man, to get Dan Light Eyes and Far Light, said the poor old man, saying we'll do the best we can and the place will immensely scan. The department plan has gone, said the poor old man. But now we have no police, said the po said the Shan Van Vogt. They were shot down like wild geese, said the Shan Van Vogt. We'd apply to the free state, and sometime soon or late, they might hang him from some gate, said the Shan Van Vogt. Fair play, Um Um I think we'll only have one does uh, a fair a couple of pretty good songs of, of George that we just won't have time to do tonight. Um but is there any open 
there are any up and coming singers in the neighborhood <laughs> they might think uh, learning um Mericoche um <clears throat> or uh John Sullivan's hat and another and the or the threshing machine there there's some pretty good songs of George's that, that we, we just really won't have time I'd say to, to, to get through tonight um Do we have another um, one? All right, though. Um, go on, is that right? Yeah, this is good. Sorry, this, this, is, this, this is one I thought we were going to have to miss out. Well. I just got news that um, Mikhail here is going to recite it for us or, or, or sing it. Um, it is this uh, account of that, that uh, uh, Michael Hurley had a bull that he had fierce mass on and was kind of keeping a bit of a, making a bit of a secret about it and snuck off with the bull and the family to Cork Show by train and George broadcasted around the whole place and here with the song. <laughs> yeah. So Michael Kelleher is making his way up here to, to sing it and a lot of the, the information that we heard during the night came, came from Michael as well. <laughs> His wife, his two sons and his daughter, the bull and they all went for his friend. When I heard it, I took a drink of spring water and asked to Johnny Yan to explain. Johnny sat down at the table as calm and sedate as could be. Saying, I'll tell you as well as I'm able. Twas the postman in his chair that taught me. <laughs> Johnny can share talk the postman. Twas Tim Green Tiger and taught him. <laughs> Here's the boy Paddy White taught Tiger and Son. And I'm sure to John Foley taught him. <laughs> John, that tall con is the tailor. He's a lap bald and tape he dropped and went up to tell Goggin the sailor. And God only knows where he stopped. <laughs> con con is taught John and Tally. They taught not brave and Jim Sean. Dick Mannion taught Barnaby Larry, and he taught the tale to Mick Bond. <laughs> Larry came down and she taught it, and Horrigan's all of the tale. Such a nose and a clue she'd not called it, and neither could nor a share. <laughs> yeah, as I was trying to tell you there, an awful lot of the, the information that we got we came directly from Michael. I didn't know he was able to sing as well, Vigar. Fair play, Michael. Um, we'll just have another one song of um, George's then, so and that's The Two Donkeys. There's about two uh, drinking companions, and one of them again was um, Ted Sweeney. Uh, in order to relieve a bit of uh, financial embarrassment during a drinking bout in Babe Murphy's in McCrome, there was a, a trade uh, that exchanged a young and an old donkey in a kind of a trading uh, arrangement. And all was well until uh, the, the bargain was vetoed by their two wives. And one of the donkeys didn't live up to the advertising <laughs> that preceded the sale. It was published by Oni Mikey O'Sullivan in his uh, Avara, Abed Avaran article in Wosgrief in May 1994, and the word just didn't be got there. Uh, the mention of trench warfare uh, implies that it was composed uh, during or, or after the First World War. Well, are you, uh, Oni, are you able to attack this? <laughs> 
Es alt kon mafi chat kon gaur kon kon fi ne chat asha post kon ne kreva. I will tell you a comical story it is wonderful droll I declare and for fear my bother or bore you I will give it a sort of an air right to lay your lay at ye right to lay your lay am right to lay your lay at ye right to lay your lay am How Mary gave Connie a pounding, and Ted got a throwing from Liz. My case in detail, like my spounding, kind neighbors are around here it is. Right to the lay, oh the lay, a dear. Oh, right to the lay, oh the lay, yeah. Right to the lay, oh the lay, a dear. Right to the lay, oh the lay, yeah. No Teddy but Connie's old donkey and can purchase Teddy's young as presses Mary for gain is there in it oh the devil a hair but but last right to lay your lay a dear right to lay your lay a right to lay your lay a dear right to lay your lay a You had a fine stately young donkey. You cast him away for two quid. You made a queer deal with the Yankee. No, didn't you, Ted? Sure you did. Oh, says Ted, prefer patience a moment. And don't get so wonderful cross. Very soon I will procure you a motor that will eat neither hay, oats, or grass. Right to lay your lay at ye. Right to lay your lay ye. Right to lay your lay at ye. Right to lay your lay ye. It will glide on the roads like a swallow, up and down hill, up and down hill. It will climb something. I will be home after driving through Mallow, while your socks and the rack will be drying. Right to lay your lay a dear, right to lay your lay a, right to lay your lay a dear, right to lay your lay a. But who should come in at that moment? But Liz, as she grasped a big stick. She said, "Ted, I dare say you are busy. Hop east for your donkey right quick. Make haste, don't be lazy, don't linger. Or my temper will surely break loose." She kept aiming at Ted with her finger and giving him tinkers of abuse. Right to the light, to the light, Addy. Right to the light, to the light, Em. Right to the light, to the light, Addy. Right to the light, to the light, Em. To add to this dreadful commotion, Con stood before the before them right grim. Saying now of a kind of a notion to fracture the most of you, Tim. That scoundrel, scoundrelous villain, you sold me. He broke the stall door into brus. He wasn't as mild as you told me. I'm telling you that to your puss. Right to lay your lay a dear. Right to lay your lay a. Right to lay your lay a dear. Right to lay your lay a. You're a cheat, a cowboy, and a rascal. Of conscience, you don't own a bit. And with the kit hog he made for him, and such a fault hog he did hit. He tumbled him over the table, knocking sliggers aware in his fall. And when Teddy came out of the corner, his face was as white as the wall. Right to lay your lay a dear, right to lay your lay a, right to lay your lay a dear, right to lay your lay a. 
there was all sorts of hair flying in bunches. Willie John said he'd go for police. It was just like a day in the trenches. There was nobody looking for peas. The road being by no complicated. I cannot well say how it went. For I got to stray clout in the pit. And under the grate I was sent. Right to rely, you rely, yaddy. Right to rely, you rely, yeah. Right to rely, you rely, yaddy. Right to rely, you rely, yeah. <laughs> Hello, good you, Tony, um, the other man, is it something I said? The other man there was um, Conley Hand, the same man that had the exploit with the department card that you heard me holler Calla singing a while ago, and, um, and you can gather from the song that his wife's name was Liz and that he was uh, a yank. Um, so that's about all the songs we're going to hear. I suppose most of you would know the lonesome story about... Um, George's death. Despite George's happy, humorous songs in Irish, in English, and with the two languages mixed, he became affected by depression towards the end of his life. He was suffering from a sore leg and visited a doctor in Mill Street. When he returned, he visited Ted Sweeney's cottage. He was very restless and Ted's wife, Mary Jane, asked him was the leg bothering him. He said that he thought it was his head that was bad. George committed suicide by cutting his throat on the banks of the, the, the Danganasalach River and falling into the water. His body was found by John Kelleher, a son of Crohutianes, and another man, maybe Johnny Conring, um, who were on their... That's right, I'm reliably informed from, from the behind here. Um, who were on their way to Patrick Lee Hans thrashing. An inquest was held in a building in Ballymacira known as the Red House. John P. Toomey.